Okay. I can handle this. There we go. Cool. So you should see some slides. Yeah. Okay, cool. Slides are there. Awesome. So uh, I'm Jessica Breen. I am the program director for geospatial research to support in the library uh, here at the university. And I run what's called the geospatial uh, research lab. So today I'm going to talk to you about some of the tools and resources available through the geospatial research lab. And perhaps you're thinking, uh, so this is going to be about GIS and that's great, but maps are maps are cool, but my course isn't quantitative and my research isn't spatial, so this isn't for me. And I would point out that uh, geospatial does not mean GIS. Uh, that's one part of the toolkit, but it's not the whole thing. Uh, and geospatial also does not mean quantitative. You can use geospatial tools with qualitative and mixed methods, methods research. Uh, but the things that we teach about take place somewhere and our data comes from somewhere. Whether you're teaching about politics or education, whether you're collecting participant interviews or monitoring water pollution levels, there is a where involved in everything. And thinking through that where, thinking spatially about your teaching and your research can be a really powerful lens. So whether we're talking about exploratory or explanatory maps, mapping enables us to take complex information and by considering it spatially, give it context that helps people connect that information to their own lives and their experiences. Mapping can help us understand how the individual pieces of our data relate to each other and start to find patterns in information that might not have otherwise been legible and can help us come to new conclusions. Um, like this. <laughs> uh, and mapping enables us to bring our work into conversation with other data and information that can enable a richer analysis and can help us make sense of the bigger picture. So the Geospatial Research Lab in the University Library is part material and part methodological. The Geospatial Research Lab space is located on the lower level of the University Library in room B53. The lab space is available whenever the lower level of the library is open. So during the semester, I believe that that is from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. It is key card access. So it is limited to use uh, through to people who have a, a current ID uh, at AU. There are nine computer stations in the lab. And there you can access a variety of geospatial software, including the ArcGIS suite, uh, ENVI or ENVI, and QGIS. You can also access the software um, remotely through the virtual apps provided by um, academic technology. Uh, some of them you're even able to download to your own machine, depending on the licensing. The lab computers also have um, the Microsoft Office suite. They have R and R Studio, along with several other stats programs installed on the lab machines uh, if you're working with different data formats. So on the methodological side, you have me, a geographer. I'm a digital cultural geographer. Uh, we like adjectives in geography. And I have significant experience in working with public participatory and community mapping projects. So you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me either over Zoom or in the Geospatial Research Lab. And these are the kinds of things that I can help you with. So let's see if my, my buttons work, they do. Uh, project planning, if you have an idea for a project involving maps or mapping, but you don't know where to start, I can help with that. Um, I've worked with a wide range of individuals and organizations at various levels of expertise, doing all kinds of mapping projects, both with and without computer software. Uh, we can talk through your idea, determine what resources you need, and figure out how to accomplish the goal using the tools and data that fit into your existing workflows and methodologies. Um, let's see. Assisting with finding geospatial data is a large part of what I do, uh, whether that's helping you find maps or shapefiles, um, I can assist you in finding geospatial data. And if the data that you want doesn't exist, uh, I can help you work around that, figure out what other data might work as a proxy or work with you to create data, the, the data that you need. Um, additionally, the Geospatial Research Lab is responsible for curating the library's geospatial data collection. So I have funds to purchase data. So if there's something, a uh, data set that you want to use, but we don't have it and it's geospatial, uh, we can look into buying it. Geospatial analysis, I can assist with that. If you're not sure if you need a table join or a spatial join or what the heck the difference between the two of them is, uh, I can walk you through that. Cartographic design. Uh, so if you need a map for a publication or just a class presentation, I can help you find the tools and data to, to make the map and advise you on best practices for making a, a map that's gonna actually convey your information in a clear and hopefully aesthetically pleasing way. Geospatial data handling. So if you're not sure how to store your geospatial data once you're done using it, uh, where it's going to live. This is, again, something I can help you sort out. 
Uh, we also do GIS training. So hopefully, happily, not every GIS, every project is going to need GIS. Uh, but if it does, we do have training available. We have self-paced GIS jumpstart class on Canvas that you can request to join through the GIS and cartography libguide. Uh, we also have access to ArcGIS and QGIS training through several different providers. And if it turns out that there's not already a training for what it is you're trying to do, we can work to create something new. I can assist you with geospatial software troubleshooting. Uh, it happens sometimes you just can't figure out why the table won't geocode. Why does the error asking you about drawing pyramids keep popping up? Uh, I can help you figure out what's going on. I can also uh, liaise with you for you to our service provider at Esri if it's a, an ArcGIS problem. And speaking of ArcGIS, um, I am the person who manages the distribution of those licenses. So if you need one, email me. And here is how you can email me. My email is geospatial at american.edu. Uh, you can always email me questions or start a conversation there. Uh, if you want to go ahead and book an appointment to, to chat directly, uh, the QR code here goes to my bookings calendar. And you can also find a link to my bookings calendar on the library's Ask a Librarian page. So that is everything I have. So I'm going to stop sharing. Dun, dun, dun. Thank I find you, the button. Jesse. There we go. I'm going to switch from Jesse's Google Slides to a PowerPoint presentation here in just a second. And I will start with talking about um, research data resources that the library makes available to the campus community. Can you see the slide that says research data resources? Yay. All right. So a quick overview. I'll talk about licensed online databases that we have with downloadable statistical or numeric data, data sets that we have in our own repository that you can download, um, how to request the addition of new resources of that sort, what subject guides we have on statistical resources and on data, then on um, ways or um, tools for making your own research data available or planning that out. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our ongoing uh, migration of our institutional repository content from one platform to another. Um, if you made this morning's um, event with Rachel Borchardt, you already know all about that. So first, um, the library, as many of you will know, license hundreds of online databases for EU users that deal with um, all kinds of content. Journals, e-journals, e-books, videos, what have you. And among those couple of hundred, you can select the subset that contains numeric data. Um, there is a pull down for database types and this, this shows you the kinds of content that, has it, that is in them and just over a hundred have numeric data in some form. That means something you could put into a spreadsheet and I don't know, sum up or calculate something on. It's not necessarily a data set with many different columns, but it is a um, computer readable numeric data set. These kinds of resources, aside from being selectable, as I just mentioned, are also identified with a little icon in the list of all the databases that is supposed to look like a spreadsheet or table with a down arrow indicating this has this contains downloadable data that you download from the website of these uh, information provider, usually an external vendor that the library subscribes to. And if you have any questions about these databases with or without numeric data, they, we have the Ask a Librarian uh, service, which is during the semester staffed round the clock either by EU librarians or an external service provider for online um, service. Here are some examples of the over 100 databases with numeric content that we have. Um, you will see some are international in focus, UN data, for example. Um, some are US centric, like data planets, statistical data sets, or simply analytics. Some are uh, specific to one kind of uh, data type, like Latino Barometro, 
This data are all from public opinion surveys in Latin America. Others are across disciplines. Um, Statista is social sciences, business, what have you. Wharton Research Data Services is very um, business centric or economic centric. So this is just a sampling of the ones we have. On a couple of them, you will notice at the bottom of the description, it may say that there is a limit on the number of simultaneous or concurrent users. That is not something the library has come up with to make life hard for EU users. That is, that is imposed by the vendors of the resource. So there, for example, this is simply analytics. Um, this can only be used by five users at a time. Um, when somebody, if, when a sixth user tries to connect to it, it will say all the seats are taken, so to speak. And when a seat becomes available, the next user can then log in, which also means that anybody using that to be friendly to other users should log off when they're done with their work. Otherwise, otherwise it just times out after a certain time, like 10, 20 minutes. So the aforementioned ones where all data sets that are housed on the um, web portal of a vendor, external commercial vendor for the most part. Then we also have licensed data sets that we purchase or acquire from external resources, sources, sorry. And we house them in a U library's own repository. <clears throat> and here's a screen snapshot from our the repository that we still have and that we have had for over half a decade, AU Digital Research Archive, and that is in the process of being moved and I will talk about that in a moment. What they all have in common is these are data sets you do not analyze in any way online through the web browser. You have to download these to your desktop and then um, work with them in the requisite file format. That could be Excel, that could be SPSS, or Stata or R that will vary depending on the data set. Then we have subject guides um, on the listings of external resources related to statistics and data, the statistical information guide. I should have changed that. Clement Ho just retired at the end of June. So this is in the transition of being um, handled by various people. So this is statistical information in general. And then I have one on research data across the life cycle, which is mostly about how AU researchers can share and manage their own research data, but also a little bit of how, how to find externally existing research data. For data management planning creation, data management plans are now required by an increasing number of funding agencies when you apply for a grant. Um, there is the DMP tool that is maintained by the California Digital Library. And if you sign in where that's marked with a green circle, um, with your AU credentials, you see some um, AU specific guidance, but you don't have to, most of this is available um, to anybody. And you can use this to either just look at the templates for data management plan by different funding, uh, entities, foundations, and government agencies, at, or you can use it to generate your own data management plan. That's what you see um, when you sign in with your ADU credentials. And then this was so far, this was mostly about the data that others provide to us for AU users. We also um, have a rep in our repository a space for faculty at AU to sh uh, share their own research data. And so we have a couple of uh, research data sets that were produced by AU faculty and are in the current digital research archive repository and have just literally days ago been copied over to our new repository uh, where they are accessible now as well. In a while when all the quality controls have taken place, we will remove them from the old location. And that migration from one to the other platform has taken about close to a year now, and we're nearing the end of it. And there will be announcements of as this progresses to an email list that we have, data matters L. That is an email list for announcements from CTRL and the library about 
research data, related resources, services, announcements, software, methods, courses, and what have you. And here's how you subscribe to that. Uh, many of you will have seen digital object identifiers assigned to journal articles. That's how they were originally developed for journal articles around the year 2000. But we also mint in the AU library DOIs for AU faculty research outputs. We have started that with a repository Audra, and we are continuing that with a new repository Aura. Here's an example of a research data set that's in Audra. I will not spend the time to go to look at that now, but you can see that we can assign um, DOIs to faculty outputs in the repository. We can even reserve one in advance, so you know the DOI that it will have when it becomes public. And here is a subject guide that describes a little bit of about the background of DOIs and how and why we use them at AU. There is a contact um, for that data site at American.edu. Data site is the name of the provider that we use to create DOIs. And here I wanted to mention a couple of um, online forms that are here at this URL, slash library, slash forms. Related to this, there is a faculty research deposit form, which is um, for um, submitting content to the institutional repository. That is about to be um, becoming unnecessary because the new repository has a built-in function for that. There is a library instruction session request form. If you want to have librarians come to your class, your course, and give a presentation on various um, information resources from the library. Then there are two purchase request forms. There used to be one, now there's two. One is for books and electronic books. And the one here marked in green is for all other materials that includes geospatial and statistical data sets and all kinds of other content from games to videos to um, what have you. And you can see there's a number of other forms there as well. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tiffany. Hello, everyone. Um, so reasons you would want to book a consultation with either myself or Eric Schuler um, is one, if you have questions about your analysis, um, we are here to help you with that. Again, this is with CTRL, the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning, and we're the research end of that. Um, there, are, If you have questions about the appropriate program use, um, let it be wondering if you're, you should be using Qualtrics over in vivo, or maybe it's trying to figure out what quantitative program you use. Maybe you just have a question about that. That's, you know, you can definitely ask us those kind of questions. There's uncertainty about the planning of your research or if you have questions about your methodological questions about a grant proposal. Um, areas that we do not assist with include technical support, we are that which includes AU apps um, or anything associated with um, any of the uh, programs that you may have, we're not technical support. Completing your analysis, we do not do. Classroom demonstrations, we do not do classroom demonstrations. Um, teaching or troubleshooting software or responsible for teaching students how to use the software. Those are things that we do not do. We do not write your IRB applications and we will not develop the state of the theoretical lens the researcher will or should use. Um, Eric, did you wanna add anything to this? Sure, yeah, um, I wanna mention really quick, we do have software on-demand workshops. So on our page, um, those can be updated in the near future as well as in the newer versions. Uh, so we recently just got SPSS 29, so we'll be working on the recording later this week or early next week on that. Uh, but for these ones, they're public facing. They have all the information about how to use the software. It also has stuff like Python, R, uh, MATLAB, and all the other different softwares we have. Um, I also want to talk to like, if you have questions about like, hey, my computer does, doesn't have the computing power, I need to do my analyses, reach out to us because um, we can also talk about the options of high performance computing. So that's also something I work as a liaison for that. So I'm happy to get you up and run with that too. Um, and again, just like kind of, we're always here to, to, to here to chat through like even early steps research to like if you already run your analyses and you have some issues, 
happy to talk at any point. We do encourage that if possible, talk with us early on because that way we're really able to provide as best options as possible. If it's later on, if the data is to be collected, that kind of narrows down the potential options that are possible with that. Thank you. Next yeah. slide. So the programs that we do support include um, for the qualitative and the survey side, we have Qualtrics. So a lot of people will use Qualtrics on campus, let it be, um, for doing surveys to anything for um, voting. Um, there's a variety of ways you can use Qualtrics or they use in vivo. Um, and then on the quantitative side, you have, and I'm sending it over to Eric. So we have a whole lot on the qualitative side, uh, lots of different ones. And some of this completely depends on the, uh, the your discipline. Uh, so we provide support for r, r Studio, Python, Jasp and Jamovi. Jasp and Jamovi are open source variants of SPSS, which is great because they're completely free. You don't have to worry about any of your apps. You can download it and you're good to go. Uh, there are limitations with that, though, because they're not as robust comparatively. They can't run everything from the kitchen sink, so to speak. Uh, you can also happy to talk to Stata, SPSS, Excel, um, SAS with is uh, some I'm going to mention some more specifics about that. We also have Mathematica, MATLAB, and again, HPC support. Um, we really strive and push for open coding, open data. That's, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I firmly believe in open coding. So it really makes it more accessible and it really reduces barriers. So um, I'd have to also kind of share a, a link to the B. So I had a B article that came out recently that talks about the importance of using open source for statistics. Um, so I, I really push for that. So a lot of all the workshops I do are using open source. That way everyone can use it. You don't have to purchase a license. You download this off and you're good to go. Um, some things I want to mention though really quickly. Uh, for the ones that you can have on your personal computer versus work computer and what your students can have. Um, so any of the open source ones like R, Python, Jasp, Jamovi, those ones, no problem you can download them. On most any computers, sometimes it gets a little bit tricky with if folks are using a um, a Chromebook. Those don't really play nice with some software. <clears throat> That's a potential issue. Um, and Vivo Chromebook does not work for that. Just want to mention that right from the get go. That's not going to be an option. Um, things like SPSS, we have a we have a campus license, but those are strictly for AU owned computers. So if you're using an AU owned computer, send me an email. Happy to send you a license for SPSS twenty nine. No problem. Uh, Stata, we don't have any individual licenses. We have a network license, so that can be accessed through AU apps or through the high-performance computer. Excel, you can actually download that through the My AU portal, through the Windows app, or through the, the Microsoft Office. They can download for 365. Uh, MATLAB, any computer, doesn't matter. You can download that as part of our campus license. We have all the bells and whistles. Mathematica, same deal. Um, SAS is a special case. We no longer have a campus-wide license. So if you're using SAS, it will have to be on demand. So that's the new SAS. It's, um, the, it's a browser-based version of SAS. So it's really good for teaching. Um, it's not meant for heavy computational purposes. Um, if you're interested in going from any of these softwares over to an open source, reach out, let me know. I'm happy to share uh, any learning modules or talk through things. I have a whole Canvas page built out with R. So happy to share all of that code with you all too. Uh, we also want to mention too that we the representatives for ICPSR. So Stefan and I um, for the representatives. And we also have a qualitative data repository too. Next slide. So um, the quantity of computation, uh, that's going to be me. So anything that do with statistics, whether descriptive or inferential, always happy to chat through those. Um, I do, just, I kind of this, um, whenever I talk with someone for consultations, I always ask big picture, what's your research project? What are your hypotheses, your research questions? How are you collecting the data? That way I get an understanding of the lay of the land, so to speak. I need to understand why you're doing the research and the specific questions to make sure there's alignment. Uh, that's where, because if there's misalignment, that's where like, hey, you have this data, but your research questions don't match, so you actually can't answer them. So really trying to avoid misalignment. If it's misalignment, I try to kind of guide and try to recommend like, 
Well, this type of data you have, if these are your options, this is what you can answer. So I always try to give like um different options. So I'll give like, here's a bunch of different options. Here's the benefits and here are the risks associated with each one. That way you can make an informed decision. Um, I always recommend if you can talk with me before you collect the data. If it's, if you're not, if you're using archival data, it's a different story. Uh, I just want to mention that. I always happy to chat early on because then you can really give a lot of tools at your disposal. If you can't share the data with me, that's okay. Just tell me a little bit about the data and I can simulate the synthetic version. So it's no biggie. I love simulation stuff. Um, I also want to mention too, like when you're thinking about your data, and if, let's say that something's not right and you're not quite sure, but you've already collected it, happy to talk through what's, what the possibilities are. But again, just knowing that you're going to be limited in the potential options. Uh, sometimes it might come down to like doing like a a forensic autopsy essentially on the data at that point. We try to avoid that, but I always want to be, I'm always going to be fully transparent. That's a possibility. And I've had to do that in the past. We're like, well, this is the reasons why we can't do X, Y, Z. But then using that to make informed decisions for the future. Uh, I always like to talk through the designs. There's no th such thing as a perfect research design. There's going to be pros and cons with each version. And it's going to be figured out, well, what makes the most sense given your research questions. I also talk a lot about measurement. I love measurement. I my my area of research is in psychometrics, so I'm always going to ask measurement questions because I'm always found the thought that if you have a, if you don't have a good measure, then it's going to kind of everything's going to fall apart. You have to have that strong foundation. Um, it's also when you talk with me, I'm also going to ask questions like how are you, how are you doing for your sample size when you're collecting data? You is your study underpowered? And that's where I'd recommend doing like a power analysis. If you're doing like a grant work, let me know. I'm happy to help out with the power analysis and talk through those. I always recommend tacking on an extra 30% for your sample size, just in case there's chaos responding or issues with missing data. That way you have some a cushion within that. I'm also happy to really talk about data documentation and annotated code. I always highly annotate my code. My memory is horrible. Ask anyone who works with me, my memory is atrocious. But that way I can kind of pick something up a couple of days later and I know what I was doing. But it's also really good that if another researcher says, hey, I read your paper, can I have your code in your data? I, I want to try to replicate it. That way you have it already built in. So you can go ahead and essentially send that on and you have something that's nice and packaged and nice little table, but not table, but nice file. Uh, but always happy to chat through things. Um, I love research, I love statistics. And if I don't, if I'm not familiar with something, because and I'm, my area is more psychometrics and quant side, I'm happy to look it up. And I'll, I'm always going to tell you, it's like, hey, I'm not sure about that. Let me read up and I'll get back to you. But looking forward to chatting with you all. Uh, next slide. So with the qualitative survey research side of things, um, I'm going to always ask you, very similar to what Eric asked, what is your research question and what's your theoretical framework? Um, these are typically questions that are going to be very helpful in guiding our conversation. Next, I'm going to be asking about your data collection, which includes your research procedures. How will you be collecting the data and address your positionality? Positionality statements are really important. Um, I also have an article in the beat that addresses the positionality statement and what that means. And how familiar are you with using Qualtrics and Vivo or other QDA, so qualitative data analysis software? So when I say that, um, it's really important to know what type of program you're going to be using. So it's not just to say, okay, I'm going to use NVivo and you don't know how to use NVivo. Unfortunately, I can't walk you through every single aspect of NVivo, but it's going to be important that you need to know what you're doing and how you're using it. Um, sometimes we get situations where people say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to use in vivo for, as a part of my analysis, and they don't even know how to use the, and know how to use the QDA program or the software program, um, or the software, excuse me, and it's just going to be more of a difficult, it's going to be really difficult for them, um, to analyze their, their, their data, um. When you reflect, reflect on how are you answering your research question and kind of goes back to that positionality. Does your analysis align with your theoretical framework? Again, what is your theoretical framework? You need to make sure that everything goes in sync with each other. And have you given yourself enough time to process your experience? Mm -hmm. 
we kind of want to think about when you're working with qualitative research, working backwards. Um, and it's something that I know that Eric has definitely addressed in other situations or excuse me, in other um, presentations. When we're working with data, you want to kind of work backwards in terms of giving yourself enough time. You don't want to be running up against a deadline, especially if you're doing grant work. So uh, next slide. To book a consultation with us, you're going to use this QR code. Um, there's also a link that you can use, um, and I can find the link that we can put it into the chat, unless Eric is going to do it. <laughs> okay, awesome. So Eric's going to work on getting the link and put it in the chat. There it goes. Um, but you can also use the QR code. Uh, there to book a consultation with us. I we strongly we strongly advise that you go ahead and book that consultation with enough time to give us um, to look through your data. Give us at least two weeks out. I mean, it's just really important to space things out with us. Um, you don't have to meet with us every single week. Um, we strongly advise on spacing things out. Um, and now, next slide. Do you have any questions for us? And that's it. <laughs> While the audience thinks of questions, maybe I can ask Eric one that occurred to me, if I may. So you mentioned among the many quantitative software packages that we have, you mentioned the high performance computing or HPC environment. Can you say something in what situations a researcher should or would consider using that as opposed to you know, using the virtual computing lab or the apps, I mean, or desktop installed software and what does, what process is involved in going there to compute on the HPC? Sure, happy to chat about that. Yeah, so um, think of it this way. If, if you're dealing with a large data set or dealing with something that takes more than five or 10 minutes to run, I would encourage not using AU apps. Um, personally, because that's more geared towards teaching for small toy data sets. It's not meant to run like a couple of hours. Um, it depends on your coding. I mean, you can give it a try, definitely. The, there's flexibility with that compared to other options. Like a, if, if you don't have a license of that software on your local computer, that's a good avenue to go down. Um, if you're using your own computer and you're, you're going into running into things like where it's running for like a couple of days, or several hours. <laughs> if it's like using Python or MATLAB, Mathematica, um, and some other open source ones that we have on the HPC or Stata, I would actually consider using the high performance computer, especially if it's a data set equal to or greater than a gigabyte. If it's greater than that, I would strongly consider the high performance computer. Um, the nice thing is, even if it's a small data set, if it takes a long time to run, I do a lot of statistical simulations, so they run for like days on end. So I toss it on the high performance computer because otherwise I my computer essentially becomes a brick for the next four or five days. And I can't do anything besides like open up email. So it's nice to unload that onto another workstation. Uh, for the high performance computer, it's mostly meant for batch jobs, meaning you have your code, you send it to a queue when there's resources available, it runs your job for you. You're not logged in at the time, you don't have no have it open the whole time while it's running. So it's really, you can have like multiple jobs run at the same time. So it's a really, really good system to use. You can run stuff, oh, sure. Uh, you can also run stuff interactively, but I advise against that um, just because it's, you have to maintain connection to it. If you disconnect, your job gets killed uh, and you don't have the resource, you don't have the um, the added advantages. It's gonna be potentially slower than your own computer than if using it interactively. But it's all about how you do the code. If you code stuff that's really slow, it's gonna be slow in that performance computer. It actually might be slower on the HPC compared to your personal computer, depending on how it's coded. So if, I'm happy to chat through that and talk more about it. There is a process, so if you're interested in using the high performance computer, let me go ahead and toss up a link about it. Um, I do want to mention it is at the end of the life cycle currently, I believe. Uh, however, in the next year or two, there will be a replacement system that will be comparable. Uh, there's also an HPC committee. Uh, so you need to request a license, so they're not less but a, a user account. And also students who are working with you can also request a license too. There are classes that use this. 
um, if it's a class, uh, please get the approvals early because those take time. And if you're going to be teaching with the HPC, uh, please have a conversation with me. So that way I can get you trained up if it's your first time using it. So then you can teach your students how to use it. Because again, we, we don't provide in class demonstrations. Thank you, Eric. Are there other questions from the audience? Or any of us? Uh, well, folks, I think I have a question. Uh, uh, Jessica, actually, about this. Um, for GIS, what software would you would recommend for someone who's new to GIS? Uh, what's a good entry level program to kind of get used to it? Sorry, I'm muted. Now, I, now I'm unmuted. Um, right, so if you're new to using GIS, I would actually suggest that you try out QGIS, which is the free and open source GIS software. You don't need a license for it. You don't have to be at the university in order to use it. Um, free and open source, you can just go to qgis.org and download it there. They have some really great documentation that steps you through every single little thing. It's also, uh, because it's open source, you can write your own uh, plugins to it. Plus people make plugins all the time, so it's really flexible. Um, and there is a great website, uh, it's called, uh, I think it's Spatial Thought. It's on, we have a link to it on the GIS and cartography libguide, but it's a, um, an independent researcher who writes really great tutorials for QGIS that step you through them very, very one at a time, which is really helpful when you're first learning, because it is a giant piece of software. It has a pretty steep learning curve. Uh, and the, that website actually makes it much, much simpler. But a lot of patience and um, I recommend I buy stress balls for my students that are little globes. So just keep a stress ball on your on your desktop. It it will it will take some getting used to. You're going to do the data matters question, Stefan? It's in the chat. Oh, I was just sharing my slide. Did that not show up? Oh, it showed up. OK. OK. Should I put it? Uh, John, let me know if you got what you needed from there. Um, I can put it back up again. It's not a single link, hyperlink. <clears throat> and this recording will also be made available. Of this session. Okay. So it's at the bottom, the last bullet is the instruction for joining that list. It has currently about 70 EU faculty member participants.